Um, I chose something from the book of Ecclesiastes, and to be honest, I, I started uh, a couple weeks ago when I saw this coming up, I knew that I, even though we were going to read Song of Solomon too, um, I was like, I know that I'm going to want to choose something within Ecclesiastes, uh, because I love the book. And uh, so, but there's plenty of things that you can learn from, from the book, and um, I chose hopefully something that's going to be particularly helpful to us tonight. So um, Ecclesiastes, one of my favorite books of the Bible, uh, filled with a very important or very important perspectives. And I'll say this, I, I'm, what we're not doing in these teaching nights are trying to summarize everything that we've read, or tonight, it'll be our only night in Ecclesiastes, at least till the end of the year, and we're not try, I'm not going to try to summarize the point of Ecclesiastes tonight. Um, and Hevel. we're not exactly, what's that? Hevel. Hevel, yeah, that can summarize it. Done it. Um, we are uh, not even really teaching a Bible survey per se as we move through this, but I'm, I'm choosing, and there's, there's a, a team of us actually um, that choose, hey, this is one thing that we'd like to emphasize and bring to light in the teaching. So, um, so I won't be teaching the whole book of Ecclesiastes, and similarly, um, even the entire book of Ecclesiastes especially, it doesn't give a really complete, full picture of who God is and eternity. Um, you're not going to find that necessarily in the book of Ecclesiastes. So this is kind of a point that I want to emphasize tonight within the point of Ecclesiastes, within the point of the whole Bible. Um, so it's just a piece, all right? So um, Ecclesiastes, it means... A uh, preacher or teacher or somebody who gathers people together to, to address them, like a lecture. Um, and the Hebrew word, if you watched the, the Bible Project video, you saw um, Ecclesiastes uh, in Hebrew is uh, the word Kohelet, or however you want to pronounce it. I'm going to say that several times tonight, Kohelet, um, just as the, the main voice in this, in this book of Ecclesiastes. All right, and then I think in the ESV it says the, the preacher, right? Um, uh, but that's Kohelet when you hear when you hear me say that. Um, I'll start this way. A question that I was asked at the beginning of a financial planning presentation that was being given to me um, a few years ago. And it, it, it literally started this way. Like, we sat down at this table right here, and the person giving the presentation said, Jared, where do you want to be? Where would you like to be? Um, and he went on to kind of explain that. Like, in the future, what would you like for your life to look like? Or what would you like for your life to be like? Where do you want to get, like, what do you want to, what do you want to, get to. Um, maybe some of <coughs> y'all would like, as you think that through, if that was the presenter uh, of a presentation coming to you with that question, maybe you would have some answers to that. So I want to ask for just raw honesty. Um, it's okay if something that you're wanting to get out of life is, uh, or it's okay for these purposes to, to mention it. I'd like to ask you guys, what what would you say to those things? Right or wrong, Hevel or not, um, what, uh, what would you say? Where do you want to be? Where would you like to be? What kind of things would you say? It's OK if it's a, in Cancun for retirement. <laughs> Seriously, what, what kind of things do you think? I think in a balanced space for me, whether it be head, heart, life, a relationship, just have a good equal to work on having a good equal space for everything okay and not have it be jumbled or misconcept or just things misplaced is a lot of that involved time yes okay so a, a good balance of time for the important things in your life mm -hmm. okay 
somebody talk about the material. I want to own you... at least five income properties in ten years. Okay, I knew that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that concrete enough? Yeah, that's good. Example. That's good. <laughs> so that we have passive income, basically. Got it. Okay. What else? <laughs> it's kind of um, yeah, really. Uh, it's a very good question, but for me, because. I was married before, and I thought I would be married for this time, and now it's different. So I think for me to just be happy and okay. and to stay happy, yeah, okay. just be just be happy. So wherever you are, whatever's going on, just yeah. to have happiness. Just have happiness. Okay. Yeah. What else, y'all? Come on. I know you got some stuff. Any retirement hopes? <laughs> yeah. Famous like, actors? <laughs> we just, to, just to be famous actors? <laughs> My Oscar. 10 years, 20 years, okay, 30 so years. Just, whenever. Yeah, just at some point. You, I mean, honestly, Clay, you probably love, love to have some awards. Yes, I mean. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would like to direct a feature film by third. Okay. It's concrete. Good. Um, clear goal. Yeah. I'd love to do uh, something I really enjoy waking up for every day as my main source of income. Okay. So to have a have a uh, enjoyable job. Yeah. A fulfilling job. Yeah, but I guess like I guess it's I I almost am like it's like the perfect job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect job. Okay. <laughs> like hand tailored for me. Do you know what that is or you don't even know yet? You just wanna Yeah, oh I totally know what it is. I no, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think I, that's gonna be hard to reach that goal. <laughs> that doesn't exist, guys. I'd like to have, uh, like, when I think way, way future, I'd like to have kids that are walking with the Lord mm -hmm. and like really good friends. Cool. And when I have that in life, I'm always just kind of content in that. Yeah. Those are the things I love. I would like to start my gospel center charity that even after I die, there will be lasting impact. Got it. Okay. Nice. Yeah. What about you? <laughs> um, I I used to kind of want I, I yeah I used to kind of want the the big house and the just a lot of money, and uh, there's been times in my life too, that, and I still think this at times, that I'm like, I would love to be, have some, um, I guess fame, but for people to know who I am. Um, I, I've thought in the past, man, I like to write a book, not just because I have really good content for a book, but it'd be cool if it's like, oh yeah, he's the author of that book. And to be honest, those, those have subsided a little bit. Now sometimes I think my desire is for our, our church to look a certain, to, to get a certain place, which might involve, like I can think, man, it would be so cool if we had five or 10 fellowship groups like I think man that would be like I would feel just satisfied and to some extent successful if that kind of went down thanks for asking Charles <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else y'all have heard uh, of uh, even other people just trying to get out of life married okay yeah some people it's like man I just love to be married mm -hmm. I know for a lot of uh, baby boomers and probably some Gen Xers, it was all this idea of, of, I mean, retirement is just like Mecca and just be, not having to work and to be able to do the things that I've always wanted to do for uh, the rest of my life. I just want to get to this place where I can take the vacations that I want to take, when I can um, get the rest that I want to get and just won't have to worry about producing income anymore. 
Um, yeah, so I think a lot of them have to do with material possessions, with some sort of fame. Uh, so imagine if somebody sat down and were giving that financial presentation um, to the writer of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, early in his life. Kohelet, what, what do you want to, what would satisfy you? What would you like to get out of life? And he might have said, uh, I don't know, like early before some of the things described in Ecclesiastes, he might say, I don't know exactly um, what that would be. So I would just like to get it all, right? Everything possible, I'd like to try all of that to see if that can provide some fulfillment and satisfaction to me. And you can see the, the um, presenter saying, well, you know, okay, that's, that's nice, but let's like, can we focus in a little bit on some goals um, that, you, that would be most important to you that you'd like to try to attain or get to? And Kohel would say, no, no, I, I, I'm just, I want to try it all literally everything I possibly can. So, okay, let's come up with a plan to get there. So, um, I, I assume he set some kind of goals. Uh, seems like he did. And he achieved them all, maybe for our benefit. Um, he achieved his goal of wisdom. He was wiser than anyone else before him, it says in Ecclesiastes. He achieved his goal of pleasure. He achieved his goal of stuff. He had big, beautiful houses and parks and pools. He achieved his goal of not having to do anything because he has a lot of slaves. He achieved his goal of having lots of money, gold and silver. Uh, this is all listed out in the beginning of chapter two. He achieved his, this goal of being entertained. Like it, he has singers and just live music, I guess, at his beck and call. Um, his goal of maybe sexual fulfillment, he had a bunch of concubines, could probably get whatever he wanted out of that. Um, but what's the one word, at, like after he accomplishes so many of these things, all of these things, anything that he set his mind to, what's the one word that he used to describe what he found in attaining all of these things? Hevel, or what are some other? Vapor. Vapor, what, what else? Meaningless. You, meaningless. meaningless, that's a common one. So, vanity. What's, yeah. vanity, that's ESV's version. Um, yeah, what, what is y'all's best understanding of that word, uh, Hevel? Is, can somebody even add some more description to it? it doesn't it to say it's like the idea? Smoke. Yeah, not. vapor or smoke. You can kind of see it, but it's then like you can't really. Yeah, yeah, kind of like a hologram, I guess. Super fancy. Yeah. I liked in the video how he talked about it doesn't, the meaningless word isn't a great translation because mm -hmm. we take meaningless as worthless. Mm -hmm. And he's not saying these things don't have meaning, mm -hmm. but that they're like smoke. When yeah. you try to grab onto it, it disappears. Mm -hmm. So not that these things are inherently bad or evil. Right. Good. Um, yeah, I, from, from what I've found, that's, that seems to be some good description. Um, I wonder if, like, what if Kohelet had like a 40-year follow-up to his, this financial advising presentation, and he was looking at his portfolio and the securities that had built up in life, and his, the advisor's like, wow, I'm even surprised, but you actually, you, you got it all. Um, and Kohelet just says at the end of it, hevel. All is hevel. This was, this was like chasing after wind. Um, uh, another question, just before we really dive in, is does Kohelet's kind of evaluation of all of these goals and things to attain, does that stack up with life as you've seen it? Like, do you see those types of things, some of his endeavors, these, and, and finding some vanity or, or fleetingness in those things? Like, do you see that in, have you seen that in reality? Yeah. Yes. Okay, how, what are some of those ways? Just describe what, what, what you see. 
As people chasing fame and fortune. Okay. So people are chasing fame and fortune and say they actually arrive at some fame. Are these just the happiest people in the world? Not necessarily. <laughs> usually not. I would probably say usually. Um, yeah, same thing with fortune. People get a billion dollars, um, and I, I think you would, you would hear or you would find consistent in life, there's a lot of people that once they get to a certain amount of wealth, they're not able even to enjoy it. Maybe some do, some find some enjoyment. Some maybe are famous and they get some, um, uh, some enjoyment, some satisfaction, some meaning out of it. What about like geniuses? <laughs> yeah, a lot of geniuses go crazy, go crazy or uh, a lot of times you'll meet someone who's a genius, but their relationships or like their personal skills are a disaster and yeah. they don't have a good relationship. Yeah. Again, not always, but that certainly can be the case with somebody that's just a, an intellect or savant in some particular area. Um, yeah, and, and I think you could say that, like, you don't even, we could have this conversation with somebody who doesn't even believe in God, right? That, like, I've had plenty of conversations, even with non Christians, and it's like, what do you, it, is fame going to satisfy? Is fortune going to satisfy? And even a lot of them would say, no, you're right. I, you know, I can see, I've had these conversations. It's like, oh, you're trying to be famous, but do you see famous people in their life? Do you, do you really want that? Is everybody, no, that actually doesn't, it doesn't amount to satisfaction or meaning or value. Um, but it, that, that message is something that anybody that can kind of observe the universe might be able to find out. For some, it works out and it's good for them. For others, it doesn't necessarily work out. Yet, we see people striving for these things, and sometimes even ourselves, we fall into this striving for these things all the time around us. There's just this draw to some of these dreams of, of knowledge and wealth and um, stuff. Um, just I want to explore kind of a few observations. We'll land kind of with one main verse. Uh, it was on the social media post earlier this week or yesterday. Uh, but just a few kind of observations that Kohelet gives to kind of prove that these things are, are like striving after wind. So kind of think about those things, maybe in your own life even, these, the, the biggest dreams that you have of, of where you're hoping to get. Just kind of bring those into your mind, what you'd like to lay hold of eventually. Not just stuff, that's easy to just jump to stuff, but like wisdom or fame or just anything that you're kind of aiming for in this life. And Kohela is going to warn us with four reasons, or there's more than four reasons, but I'm going I'm to mention four reasons that that striving may be in vain. Four reasons that you might be frustrated with that endeavor. And I'm going to pitch them to you as kind of like verses to a song. And then we're going to come to a chorus at some point that's repeated throughout. But um, think of these as kind of verses to the song or arguments that um, why striving for these big dreams, these big goals may be in vain. First of all, strive as you may, you may not be able to get it. Whatever those things in your mind are. Strive as you may, you may not be able to get it. Um, as we talked about in our stewardship series last year, God gives to some more, to some people more, not just stuff or finances, but even uh, intellect and book smarts or relational capacity, whatever it is, God gives to some more, he gives to some less. And he may not choose to give you what it is that you are hoping for in particular. Um, Ecclesiastes 3.14, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything can be taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. So you're not going to add on top of to what God's plan is, and if he hasn't determined for you to have that thing that you're going for, uh, you're not going to have it. Now, 
um, for millennials, many of us here, I think it would do us good to hear that you can't accomplish anything you put your mind to. <laughs> you just can't, okay? I understand, like, this is breaking down what your parents and what your teachers told you and whatever, but, like, could we logically just reason and say, no, just because I put my mind to something doesn't mean necessarily that I'm going to get whatever that thing is that I'm going for. We are, like, optimistic dreamers, but Ecclesiastes 5.7 says it well. When dreams increase and words grow many, I'm going to do this and this and this, there is vanity. So you, like, you could talk big and you can have these big ideas and you think, I can do anything that I put my mind to, but your chances of YouTube success are minute. Mm -hmm. Like it's one in a million that are going to actually get um, what they're hoping to get uh, as far as success in that. Um, another thing, it, even if you do all the right things, it is still by chance that you will succeed. Um, Ecclesiastes 9.11, again, I saw under the sun. Listen to what he says. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, like what you'd expect, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. I was just talking with uh, Clayton a few weeks ago, and he was talking about the acting career and how with acting, if, if you want to, like, finally land the big gigs. Um, it's, it's not only like you're a professional athlete, he said, like you have to train and you have to take all the right classes and you have to prepare yourself and make sure that you're in a, a, a good place and that you have the talent that you need to have to get there. Um, he said on top of that, on top of being trained like a professional athlete, it's like you also have to win the lottery. Oh. Like chance has to also happen in your way. You have to just happen to bump into the right person or have the right email returned. It's, it's, it's both of those things. And um, the writer of Ecclesiastes kind of, I think, talks about that sort of thing, the frustration that we find in that in Ecclesiastes 10, 5. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. Well, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't seem fair. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking around on the ground like slaves. So, and, and horrible singers selling millions of records, oh. right? Oh my God. So you, ne like, you, you don't know necessarily, though you might strive for something and you might put everything that you have into it, you aren't assured that you necessarily are going to get it. Now that doesn't mean that you can't pursue some of those things, but um, I think that Kohelet might instruct some of us to get our head out of the clouds. He says, in the morning sow your seed, at the evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Um, so strive as you may, you may not be able to get it. I hate to burst your bubble, but you, you might not be able to work there to get it. Um, number two, a, a lesson from Kohelet is strive as you may, even if you get it, you may lose it. How many wealthy people lost their sense of security with the bad economy 10 years ago? Um, Ecclesiastes 5, there's a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. Like, man, he did the right thing to build up all of these riches, but he lost it. And he's a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand to pass on. You can't know that for sure you'll keep it. Like, how many doctors and scholars and brilliant people lose their mind eventually to dementia or Alzheimer's? Um, how many musicians were famous for a minute? They were a one-hit wonder, and then time and chance happened to them all, and he never heard about them again. Strive as you may, even if you get it, you may lose it. Thirdly, strive as you may, even if you get it and keep it, you may not be able to enjoy it. We already said wisdom 
smarts in and of themselves don't necessarily satisfy. Sometimes the more you know, this is kind of a, a sub-theme in Ecclesiastes, sometimes the more you know, the more you wish you didn't know it. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 1.18 says, For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Like, I don't know if you've ever thought to yourself, man, I just kind of wish that I, I didn't know that. Sometimes as an adult that's gone through, who has uh, parents who have gone through a divorce as you're an adult, sometimes you think, man, I, I mean, not that it's ever good, but you think, well, the two-year-old didn't, didn't know all of what was going down in this, and I as an adult, it's even worse because I have the information that I have, and it's awful regardless, but um, uh, money doesn't satisfy, right? He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, Ecclesiastes 5 says. Nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. Not only does it not satisfy, but listen to this, it also causes more stress. When goods increase, I think about this a lot, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. If you've got money, people are coming to get you. Mm -hmm. Your friends maybe oddly start kind of jockeying for position in your life. Your family members like start turning against each other somehow. Maybe you've seen at a funeral. Uh, the government starts salivating because now you have more. Um, e even thieves are like, oh, this is the right place to hit up because there's wealth here. People are coming for you. The, the, even the more you have, the more you might experience that. It goes on to say, what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Like, look at all that I've got. Cool. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer. So there's a little hint that it's actually, it's good to work and to work hard. Whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. So sometimes more uh, isn't better. Um, e even with fame, y'all, I mean, I kind of mentioned at the beginning, but do you, do you think that it's just a glorious life of fame when you can't even go out for a cup of coffee without the paparazzi knocking on your door. We, you've probably heard stories of how um, f uh, children of, of famous people, sometimes it can be a pretty messed up life. And so we see all these Hollywood stars trying to keep their children away from the public eye because of what their fame has brought. It's not necessarily uh, hunky-dory for their family. So is that stuff worth striving for. There's so many um, famous suicidal people, right? Mm -hmm. um, a critical point of Ecclesiastes that goes along with this is that God may give you whatever you're dreaming for without giving you the ability to enjoy those things or that thing. In Ecclesiastes chapter 6, you can hear the frustration of Kohelet here. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't Sometimes I'm a stranger that's enjoying it, like I'm house sitting for somebody that's really wealthy or something. I'm like, like hanging out on their pool, you know, and the fountains everywhere, and I'm drinking their top shelf liquor, and I'm petting their English bulldog, and like, and I'm like, I'm loving this life that that they've set up for me. And meanwhile, the person who has all of that stuff is miserable and doesn't want to be around people and just doesn't care about life. And um, that's me sometimes. Uh, this is vanity, that, that God would give these things, but not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity, it is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that all the days of his years are many, that's what many years means, <laughs> but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and it goes in darkness, this, this stillborn child, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it hasn't seen the sun or known anything. 
yet it finds rest rather than he, that person who's mounted all of this stuff. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to one place, it says, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So strive as you may, you, even if you get it, and even if you keep it, you might not be able to enjoy it. And fourthly, strive as you may, even if you get it and keep it and enjoy it, <laughs> then you die. <laughs> Uh, chapter 3, verse 19 and 24. What happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Now again, this is a the book of Ecclesiastes has, has kind of a, a limited perspective, but there's a, a, some points that the author is trying to prove, and it doesn't have... Uh, much to do with eternal life, except that we should consider it. Um, but that's another another topic. But um, I know a lot of times we think about with wealth, like, hey, you, you can't take it with you. You hear that kind of thing. It's like, hey, you can't. You're, it doesn't matter once you're in your casket. But even with wisdom, um, Ecclesiastes two says, I perceive that the same event happens to the wise and to the fool. And I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart, this is also vanity. Um, just a couple more comforting thoughts from, uh, about death from Kohelet. Uh, not only will your vain pursuits end in death, but you don't know when you will die. We see in a few verses there. Um, even if you do all of the proverbial wisdom to live a long life, you're not promised that long life, and it may be cut short. Um, so you might get to enjoy what you wanted to be satisfied with just for a moment and then lose it all to death. Not only that, but it talks several times about somebody else eventually is going to get your stuff. All the stuff that you've worked for might go to somebody who didn't work for it. Mm -hmm. um, it might be your kid or it might be somebody else, but... Um, somebody else gets it, and then another point kind of with that that's mentioned several times in Ecclesiastes is no one's going to remember you. Oh. Odds are you're going to be forgotten about. Oh, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> these verses, y'all, this is uh, like dreary, uh, dark, e even like as Kohel's describing it, it's like this, this is evil, he says are maddening, it's vexing, it's frustrating, it's hevel. Um, but whatever you're hoping to achieve in this life for meaning and satisfaction, strive as you may, you may not be able to get it. Even if you get it, you might lose it. Even if you get it and keep it, you may not be able to enjoy it. And even if you get it and keep it and enjoy it, then you die. So what... <laughs> are we to do like is God just trying to frustrate us do we have to live a life of meaningless gathering and collecting he says um, what like where are we supposed to turn to to rise above this meaninglessness um, there's two directions maybe more that we could go from here that that Ecclesiastes comments on two solutions, if you will. Um, I, I'd call them two movements within the same symphony. They're very different, but they're part of the same piece. Um, I'm going to pick one of those two directions and kind of land some application, but I want to at least mention the other direction of kind of where we go from here, because the other is equally or maybe even more important if you're looking at the book as a whole. But again, my goal is to summarize the book as a whole. Here, here, here one of those answers is, it's at the very end of the book, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, fear God and what? Keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. God is the only one who determines the way of the universe, and he's the only one who knows where meaning exists and satisfaction exists and good things exist. So we should do what he says. And um, I'll just leave that one there. And again, that's, that's a major point of, of 
of Ecclesiastes, if not the major point. But the solution that I kind of want to end with, it's another theme throughout, and this is what I was saying is the chorus kind of, or the refrain, it's, it's mentioned five times, kind of spread evenly throughout the book, like a chorus of a song. Um, here's one version of that chorus in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 24 and 25. I won't sing it for you. Mm -hmm. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him who can eat and who can have enjoyment. It says something very similar in Ecclesiastes 3, Ecclesiastes 5, 8, and 9. What are we to do? How are we to have satisfaction and contentment and joy and meaning in life when all of life's pursuits are seemingly a striving after the wind? And I think the answer that he presents in this chorus is to enjoy whatever God has given you now, right now. If we read those verses again, we'd see that in four of the five verses, it specifically says that, that these things, that the toil that you have right now, what, what you eat and what you drink, these are a gift. It uses that word gift from God. And there's eight other times besides these that it talks about God as the giver, the one who gives these good things. And if we have it now, we can rejoice in it now. We can't be guaranteed to find any satisfaction in what we might have one day on this earth, we can always enjoy whatever God has given us right now. And here's the verse that I think summarizes both the, the chorus and the verse um, of, of the of piece here, maybe call it the bridge, Ecclesiastes 6, 9. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Now, y'all, I think that this is a um, perspective-changing mm -hmm. um, proverbial truth that can, that can change each day of your life. Mm -hmm. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. Mm -hmm. What you have before you, that you can look at, that you can see, is better to rejoice in than what you hope one day you might have. Mm -hmm that you can't rejoice in yet. Enjoy what you have. Don't hope to enjoy what you don't have. Stop striving after wind and enjoy whatever concrete God has given you now. Don't stir up your appetite for something that you don't have or you might be pursuing hevel. There's no guarantee you're going to get it. There's no guarantee you can keep it, you can enjoy it, or live long enough to enjoy it. Enjoy what God has given you right now. Here's why I want to, why, why I land on this one specifically. Um, because we are all dream chasers. I know you all, and, and I, I heard that from some of y'all, and it's myself oftentimes, especially as American uh, millennials, but probably everyone to some extent. One day, I, would, I dream that I will be able to have this. I hope to have this amount of money by the time that I'm this age. I hope one day I will be able to go on this type of vacation. I hope desperately that my career will work out, and I hope one day that people will know who I am, and maybe I can reach millions of people one day with this book that I write, or this movie that I write, or these music videos that I produce. And I think part of in that, what we might be saying is that we're a bit discontent with where we are right now. And we wish for more. Um, or another way to say it is we can have our eyes so set on destinations that we may never get to. And then even if we eventually get there, then we die. So remember this. Oh, dream chasers. <laughs> dream chasing always ends in death, okay? <laughs> Just from, from again, the, the, the perspective that Kohelet is presenting here, you die. And in the short term, not even death, but in the short term, it's, it might produce frustration, right? It seems from him. 
Um, Ecclesiastes 5, 7 mentions, for when dreams increase and words grow many, there's vanity. So stop striving for that destination because your destination here is death, where that striving is going to be cut off. Um, I figured out what was wrong with that financial, uh, financial planning presentation that I sat through. The question of, like, where do you want to be one day? What, like, where, where, what will make you satisfied? I think that, that kind of thinking, though I'm not telling, it, it can breed discontentedness. Like, I'm not where I want to be right now. Yeah. That's where I want to get. Um, and I, I guarantee that you will live most, if not all, of your life um, frustrated um, if you don't learn to be like Paul in Philippians 4 that says, I've learned that in whatever situation I am to be content. Uh, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty, maybe more than I need, and, and hunger. Abundance and need. And Paul wasn't striving for a certain type of lifestyle on this earth or a certain dream, if I could just do this one thing on earth. He, he took life as it came to him, and whatever the Lord provided, he rejoiced in it. That's the, the, some of the theme of the book of Philippians, joy. And Paul is connecting that inten intentionally with um, contentment. Um, I also just want to mention that some of your dreams, or the dreams that I've heard from you all and others, are dreams of the past. Like, if only I could go back to this thing that I had, this great job that I had, or this living situation, or this, this Bible study, all that stuff, like this, this college Bible study that was in, it was just the most amazing thing. I just experienced so much. Like it's this dream, to, I just want to get that back, right? You all hear that thing, you've experienced that thing. And um, Kohelet tells us, say not, why were the former days better than these? For it's not from wisdom that you ask this. Uh, you're never going to get it back exactly how it is. Hopefully, you'll, maybe you'll have something similar to that. But learn to enjoy what you have now the Bible study that you have now, or the, the, the job that you have now. Enjoy what you have. Don't hope to enjoy what you don't yet have, and don't hope to enjoy what you once had. Enjoy what you have now. Uh, before I end, I just want to give a couple of disclaimers on this. Remember, I said at the beginning that Ecclesiastes doesn't really give a, a, a complete picture of God and eternity. In fact, a lot of the Old Testament, we have a lot of holes filled in from the New Testament. There's a lot that God has revealed to us in his grace that we can know about life after death. Um, but so we certainly, like, we don't see elements that are important to us as, as, as New Testament believers who have this Bible. Like, it doesn't talk about any concept of it, it, um, eternal reward or storing up treasure in heaven. Like, that's one, there, maybe there's a way that we live on earth that, that bears eternal fruit and not heaven. Well, yeah, that's important. It doesn't talk about how sometimes um, our longing on earth, I think, is really a longing for heaven and what we might experience in heaven, the satisfaction and goodness there. It doesn't, Ecclesiastes doesn't talk about something that's critically important to us, this idea of Christian mission. Like, hey, there's particular things that God calls us to and commands us to have as our aim in life. One of those making disciples. But so, so what I'm telling you tonight, I just want to make sure you know this is just a piece of the pie, a small piece of the pie, I think. So keep reading the Bible and, and, and looking at it with us on Wednesdays and whenever to kind of get a bigger picture here. Um, also, this... What this definitely doesn't mean, what, what Kohelet is definitely not saying is do whatever you want and live a reckless life of indulgence and just go be a glutton and do whatever you want because life is meaningless. Just eat and get drunk. and Because um, remember, there's another movement in the symphony that says fear God and keep his commandments. And it talks about even in, in one of those choruses, talks about how even in, in the enjoying 
of what we eat and drink and our work, um, that we should do good in those things. So we're enjoying the good things that God has given us in a way that God would have us to enjoy them. Not just, I do, I indulge myself. Um, so let me wrap this up. So I'm not trying to be a dream crusher. Um, and I would even say that it can be good to set some goals. Um, but if you're setting goals, make sure you're aiming for right destinations. And I don't think it's always bad for your soul to have some sort of temporal desires and to have some, some longings for things. Just don't spend more time thinking about those things that you don't yet have than you are enjoying what you do have. And I'm actually trying to tell you how I think what Kohelet is trying to tell us is he's inviting us to actually live life to the fullest. I did a Google search on live life to the fullest. <laughs> and I think the first site that came up, um, it, it had a list. Here's how you can live life to the fullest. Number one, create a bucket list and start checking things off. Okay. Think about everything that you want to do and then check those things off. Number two, set goals and write them all down and track what you've achieved. So once you accomplish all those things, then you'll actually get, you'll have the fullest of life that life can offer. I'm telling you, like, I, I know that seems intuitive, um, but living that way is setting up life to be empty and frustrating and vanishing. And it's a myth that you will be satisfied when your life reaches those goals that you're able to do. It might provide some temporary satisfaction, I'm not denying that. But instead, and I'm, I think this is flying in the face of social recommendations and Google, but you'll be satisfied with your life when you learn to be satisfied with what you've been given, or your lot, as Ecclesiastes talks about. So stop, stop striving for just a minute, like in your mind, and just consider like what, what you have, what God is doing in you, and what God has given you right now. Not just material resources, but where he has you in life, your job, uh, the, the knowledge and, and expertise you have, um, the, the friendships that you have or that you don't have. Um, and I wonder if, if Kohala can convince us to change our perspective a little bit. Um, sometimes when I'm walking to my part-time job down the street here, um, I'm thinking to myself how undesirable that job is. And I'm murmuring, hopefully not actually <laughs> out loud, but in my mind I'm, I'm just murmuring, thinking about what I'm going to have to do, and I'm going to have to stay out till 1.30 in the morning. And um, there's been a handful of times that when I'm in that state of mind, I, I can, by God's grace and His Spirit, switch my perspective and almost immediately begin to think about the, the goodness of God and what I have received from the Lord in that job and the relationships that I get to walk into and how God has set it up perfectly to provide exactly what we need and it's, it's literally exactly what I prayed. This particular job is exactly what we prayed for when we first moved here and a year in it's like, oh, that's, you know, there's an opening here, the owner says. And so I just begin to think, man, this is the gift of God. And when I go into it thinking this is the gift of God, my, my whole perspective has changed, and the entire night is different. And I rejoice and I have joy in the Lord. Um, just two days ago, or maybe it was even yesterday, I was here in the living room. And um, it, if you don't know, um, I think a lot of you know this, but the we rent this place, and the owner of this place is... is hoping to sell this place soon, and if they sell it, odds are they're going to tear this place down and build a tall apartment out of it. Um, and that has been, of course, to Mary Beth and I, that has been so just like um, frustrating and bothersome, and we just think, what, you know, why, why would this happen to us? This just seems so perfect, and we'll never get anything like this again, and we'll, um, like, what, we 
we're going to have to live in just a, a, a smaller apartment somewhere. It's not going to be good for our dogs. And like this, this lot that God is putting into our lap is just, it's going to be horrible. And it's just like we, and then I just had this weird realization. It was shortly before Mary Beth was at work all day yesterday. And usually I try to like kind of tidy up the house and make sure it's like calm and good when she comes home after she's been in the office. All day. And, um, and, and I began to look around after it was all set up and I'd done the dishes. Um, and I had a candle out and had some nice music playing. I wasn't trying to set anything up. <laughs> uh, no. but, I, but I had this moment of, of thinking about what I was studying and all of a sudden having this mind shift of, oh my gosh, look, like, look at what, what my lot is in life right now. And look what I get to enjoy right now, the relationships that we get to enjoy right now. And we had a birthday party here on Monday night, and it was like just so much fun and so fulfilling and, and good, and we, we got to do that. God gave that to us. And we've had other times like that in different times of our life when we weren't living here, and we'll have other times like that in the future, but it was just this moment of like, wow, like God is so good, and he's so generous, and he's um, uh, it, it was just, it was a, it was a great moment, but it was perspective change. It was like trying to think about enjoying the gift that God has given me now and not just thinking about, well, what am I going to have in the future? How good is that going to be? And what will satisfy me then? Um, and, and I would say we all, everybody in this room has some things to rejoice in now. Maybe it's a nice place. Maybe it's good food to eat. Maybe it's a job that you like. Maybe it's a job at all. Maybe it's something more significant like children that you have or a, a sweet relationships that the Lord has provided in your life. And I think that, that we would learn tonight to enjoy those things right now. And don't just think about, well, man, if I only had this. Like, maybe you're eating filet and lobster every night and maybe you're eating beans and rice every night um, because of where God has you in life. I'll, I'll never forget, um, not that long ago, uh, Chelsea was telling me, I hope you don't mind, I should but Chelsea was telling me, uh, her and Auntie were like, yeah, we just don't uh, have the income to do anything right now. And so we're eating, I think it was beans and rice, right? I didn't know. <laughs> so check this out, but she's like, but you ought to taste the way that we make beans. <laughs> the seasoning, and she said, you would, love it. you would really love it. I'm thinking, yeah, I'd love a bowl of beans. Um, but, like, if, if that's where you're at right now, enjoy it and stop just wishing, oh, maybe eventually I can have lobster and play with you. Um, enjoy what you have. And... Because I don't know if the dreams that you have will be your lot, but I know your lot is what you have right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, uh, it's better is a handful of quietness, I love this, than two hands full of striving, of toil and striving after the wind. Like just, this, this is what you got, just enjoy it, relax, and um, instead of killing yourself to get somewhere where you may not even be able to get or enjoy. Mm -hmm. I love how um, Ecclesiastes 5.20 puts it, um, that those who kind of live in this way will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Like you, aren't, you, you will stop caring about what you've accomplished or what bucket list item you've checked off because you know that, hey, eventually you're dying and that stuff is going to fade away. But you've recognized along the way a good and a generous God and he has kept you occupied with joy, it says. So you can't even think about your, the days of your life. So are you going to live hoping to enjoy what you may never get? Or are you going to live enjoying what you've already been given? And if you do the latter, then you won't much remember the days of your life because God keeps you occupied with joy in your heart. Ecclesiastes 6, 9, better is the sight of the eyes and the wandering of the appetite. Uh, let me pray. Father, I thank you for um, for all that you have given to us. 
some of that that we have right now and some of it that we don't have anymore. And there are other things yet that you'll still, some good, even good temporal gifts that you'll give to us uh, in the future. And um, we just want to recognize that you're, you're very generous. And um, we're not going to be satisfied just with the things that you can give to us. Um, if you desire to give them to us, you will. And if you desire to give us satisfaction in those things, you will. Um, but, but it seems that your desire is for us to recognize you who has given those things and to be satisfied and to be content. Um, there's the things that we hope for in this life are, are so uh, piddly and um, sometimes unimportant. Uh, when we think about the perspective that we have of eternity and truly uh, what matters. Um, so even in those goals that we set in life, Lord, and this is maybe outside of what I was saying tonight, but in those goals that we set, I pray that you would direct those in our minds, that you would help us to look for um, the things that you call us to, that you desire from us, the um, real actual callings in our lives and not just what we kind of want to achieve or we kind of want to get to. Would you help to mold in us right goals? Um, and uh, in the meantime, Lord, help us to enjoy what we have right now. You have provided for all of us. You will provide for all of us. Um, you've given us so much even more than we deserve. And um, so we thank you for it, Lord. Would you keep this uh, in our minds um, just in some ways, would you help us just to see what is right before us and what's eternally valuable and kind of maybe skip some of the, the stuff in between and its level of importance. Um, Lord, thank you for your word. Just continue to teach us uh, through our study of scripture together. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.